Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Atlanta Council. Thank you so much for joining us. There's a lot of you in the room and even more online. We're going to be talking about the national cybersecurity strategy that was just launched into the world a few weeks ago. We have with us a number of the key implementers who are actually going to be taking this strategy toward fruition. Um, today's discussion, a big thank you to the staff, both of all four agencies, but also the Atlanta Council for putting this together. We haven't had a chance to have you all on stage at once. Thank you for spending some time with us, and let's just jump right in. Next to me and starting our conversation is Kemba Walden, Acting National Cyber Director with the Office of the National Cyber Director at the White House. Next to her is Ambassador Nathaniel C. Thick, U.S. Ambassador at Large for Cyberspace and Digital Policy with the U.S. Department of State. Jen Easterly, Director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And Marshall Miller, Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General with the U.S. Department of Justice. We're going to go through some questions with this group up here, and then we'll have a time to take questions from both you in the room and those of you online. But to start, Kemba, given the ONCD's team pretty central role in actually drafting the strategy, I wonder if you could get us started. Talk through some key framing assumptions for the strategy. What were two or three places you really wanted this team to focus on shifting the foundations of the debate? Well, first, thank you, Trey and Atlantic Council, for having us here. It's lovely being here with all of my colleagues. We work together on a regular basis, and it's nice to be able to talk to you. Uh, so the strategy, there are, there are some fundamental shifts, as you recognized, in the strategy. Um, first, we had to start with what we wanted cyberspace to look like. What are we trying to achieve? What is our North Star? Um, and that is to have a defensible, resilient digital ecosystem that is aligned with our values. That's what we were trying to achieve. At bottom, uh, our constituents are the American people, right? How do we do this for the American people? And at its core, uh, it's, it's reliant, significantly reliant on collaboration and cooperation, as you can see here among departments and agencies, but with the private sector, academia, civil society, and et cetera. Um, so there are, there are two major shifts that we articulate in the strategy to achieve that North Star of a defensible, resilient ecosystem, digital ecosystem. Uh, one is that we needed to shift uh, the cybersecurity risk burden from individuals, from consumers, um, from uh, communities, lift it off of those individuals that are least capable of withstanding cybersecurity risk, shifting it to entities, and I include the federal government in that, entities that are more capable of bearing the cybersecurity risk to buy it down. Now, we all know in this room that you don't get to zero risk. Um, it's all exercise of mitigating risk. So what do you do with that residual risk? Well, you have to make sure that it's resilient, not just that the technology is resilient, but that the people in cyberspace are resilient and that our roles and responsibilities are resilient. Um, the strategy has five pillars, all with an assortment of tools for us to achieve that North Star, and we'll probably talk about them in greater detail, but there are two APIs that I hope that we will talk about. We built an API into our strategy for workforce for digital skills. Um, and we also built an API in our strategy in the form of a full pillar, because it's important, uh, for international cooperation and collaboration that my buddy Nate is going to probably talk a bit about. Um, but that is, those are the major shifts. That's fantastic. I like that notion of an API in the strategy. We're not going to try to do it all at once. <laughs> we'll be talking out to different networks. Yeah. Um, so I like. I want to follow on this. This idea of shifting the burden is, seems like one of those central points in the strategy, mm -hmm. um, and specifically the emphasis on the security of cloud computing. Thinking about these services as being incredibly widely used and the actual adoption of them as being a big part of the discussion about how to drive security down the ecosystem. I mean, I think we're talking about everyone from the CIA to Walmart, right, adopting these services. It seems like the security of this infrastructure is really a key part of the ongoing security conversation. And so, Jen, I'm curious for you, we've seen a couple of examples of breaches and security failings in the cloud industry over the last couple of years. Your deputy at Brandon Wales, I believe, actually testified about one such incident relating to solar winds in March of 21. How does the strategy empower or cheerlead for CISA to go out and help encourage resilience in the largest cloud service providers? Yeah. and Harry and the entire NCD team for the incredibly collaborative way you all work to develop the strategy and now we're uh, team cyber and implementing it. So, you know, great question uh, and one that I know you've thought a lot about, uh, Trey. So, so thanks for moderating this conversation. You know, we know that uh, cloud infrastructure is important and helpful for businesses of all types, right? Large and small. 
Um, in particular, we're very focused at CISA on these target-rich cyber-poor entities, schools, hospitals, public utilities, water companies that frankly don't have the resources or the expertise to be able to effectively secure their data on premises. So for these types of uh, entities, it's even more important that we think about this burden shifting concept. And I think it's a, a brilliant and you know, really a game changing um, piece of this. But in, in the context of cloud providers, you know, the so-called shared responsibility model, that is not a one size fits all concept. Frankly, for the vast majority of businesses, the preponderance of the security burden must be placed on those big cloud providers. And that means uh, baked in security by default. So MFA by default, robust security logs, uh, access controls like uh, password complexity requirements, all baked in by default. Incredibly important that they take that responsibility on. Now we know that major corporations that put hundreds of millions of dollars into provisioning and managing their cloud, they may want a certain degree of autonomy. But for the 99.9% .9 of, of businesses, which are small businesses in this country with a median size of less than 20, they absolutely should not be bearing this burden. So at the end of the day, security is safety. Safety has to be baked in. And to your point on solar winds, and I actually last night I read this great report. I'm going to read it again. I love Winnie the Pooh on the color. If you haven't read it, read uh, Broken Trust. But you're absolutely right. I mean, this was about solar winds, but it was just as much about uh, weaknesses in the cloud and limited visibility. One of the reasons why we didn't detect impact on some of the departments and agencies is they couldn't afford to pay for that visibility and so they didn't have the security logs. Now we're in very robust conversations with our tech partners and we are hoping to make some progress in this, but incredibly important that those who can bear the burden, bear the burden. The last thing I'd say is we're about to release a product, multi-seal with our federal partners and with many international partners, on principles and approaches to secure by design and secure by default. Uh, a lot of this is really about pillar three. How do we shape the ecosystem for more resilience? And it's rooted in three things. Vendors uh, must own the security outcome for consumers. Uh, vendors must provide and consumers must demand radical transparency when it comes to security implementation. And three, uh, businesses at all levels, and in particular technology manufacturers and software providers, need to embrace corporate cyber responsibility, need to own cyber risk as a matter of good governance. And so to the strategy, which I would say is both ambitious and audacious, I think it really meets the moment. And these are important things that we have to make progress on. That's fantastic. I like that notion of corporate cyber responsibility. I suspect we're going to hear some more about that. Um, Nate and Marshall, I want to come to you. So we've seen in the last year and a half some tremendous horrors in the war in Ukraine. And it's underlined in some ways the importance of the transatlantic community, these alliance relationships that we've built. So we know that cyber is not a one, one team sport, not a, not a one nation sport. Um, so Nate, I'm curious for you, given how invested the State Department has been in capacity building throughout its history, how can the U.S. be working more closely with allies and partners to be thinking about driving capacity, not just to raise the baseline, but shared operational capabilities, shared, shared common operating models. I know you all have a strategy that's in the works as well. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about this. Sure, happy to. And, and it is a pleasure to be up here with colleagues and, and back at the Atlanta Council. I was a summer intern here in the summer of 1997, <laughs> so a homecoming for me. That's good. Um, and uh, I was in Brussels on March 2nd, um, the day that the strategy was released. Uh, and really got a visceral sense of the hunger uh, on the part of our NATO allies uh, and our, our uh, colleagues across the EU. Uh, I spent the entire day fielding very specific, detailed, insightful questions that come only from reading it closely and thinking deeply about it. So uh, make no mistake, the, uh, our national strategy is of great interest to, uh, to allies and partners around the world. Um, when we talk about capacity, uh, let me take a step back and frame it in, in terms of how we think about this at the State Department in terms of geopolitical competition. And let's use cloud computing as an example. Uh, if we'd all been sitting here in 1993, say 30 years ago, implicitly we had a, a, an unassailable, seemingly unassailable advantage in telecommunications technology. Uh, we, the United States, Korea, Japan, uh, Western Europe, we had Samsung and Ericsson and Nokia, but we also had Bell Labs and Motorola 
uh, we had Alcatel and Lucent, this deep bench of companies. Most of them are gone. Uh, those that remain are not what they used to be. Uh, and so we're fighting from behind in a lot of ways at the foundational layer of the global internet. And uh, it's worth thinking about the areas where we currently have technology advantage and what's required to sustain and defend that advantage. Because like anything in life, it's easier to defend it than it is to regain it when you lose it. And I think cloud computing is a terrific example. It's no accident that uh, the top five cloud computing providers globally are American businesses. I would make the argument that uh, they are foundations of national strength, that technology innovation broadly will be a foundation of national strength, more like demography or uh, ge uh, geography than like military capacity or GDP, which are downstream of technology innovation. So uh, really at the foundational layer for us, this is about building coalitions around sustaining and defending strategic advantage in technology areas that are essential to the future of a free and open, global, interoperable, reliable, secure internet so that we're not fighting from behind. It's interesting. So one follow-up for you, as you're thinking about the way this strategy comes together, to what extent do you see public consultation or open sort of war cooperation with these companies being a part of that process? In the international strategy? Yes, sir. So uh, we'll have an exciting announcement uh, next week. Someone who's from the community who's known to, to probably all of you is going to join our team to work uh, with us on the strategy. Uh, my office is tasked in the NDAA with, with taking the lead in drafting the international cyber strategy, which, uh, as, as Kemba said, is uh, designed to snap into the national strategy in a way that's very kind of congruent and derivative. And so uh, it was engineered by design from the outset <laughs> uh, in a way that I, I think is actually pretty elegant and, and is going to be helpful. Um, so uh, I think you're going to see some of, the, some of the threads and the themes continue. And uh, the, the demand for capacity building uh, and literacy support around the world is absolutely overwhelming. Uh, and and it, it takes a bunch, of, a bunch of different forms. One that I would highlight is we tend to think of it in terms of technology capacity building, but that's only a piece. Um, one, one of the, the, the greatest uh, areas of assistance that we can give allies and partners is actually in the conceptual arena the cultural arena, the strategic arena, where, sure, uh, approaches have to be tailored to unique national circumstances, but a lot of what we've done uh, across the different parts of the US government can, in fact, be templated and then customized. Uh, and so that's going to be a big piece of it, too. Let's not reinvent the wheel. I like that. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Speaking with the API concept, too, there's a lot of good engineering learning going on here. Marshall, I want to come to you and extend this allies question. Pillar two has got DOJ front and center. So as we're thinking about disruption and noting that uh, the department's been active with European allies against some darknet forums and cryptocurrency mixers in just the past few weeks, what do you see as the evolution of those kinds of disruption activities over the next few years? And to what extent are allies playing a bigger role in that, a different role in that? How is that evolving? Well, thank you, and thanks for uh, welcoming me here. Um, it, allies are critical to every disruption detection uh, and dismantlement effort that we engage in. Um, the world uh, gets smaller every day. Um, cyber crime, uh, cyber threats are international in nature inherently. Uh, and we need to make sure that those borders don't get in the way of our being able to follow through on pillar two um, and disrupt and dismantle the, um, our, the threat actors that are out there. Um, we've been working hard as a department um, uh, to put together the kinds of coalitions that we need to be effective. Um, we do that at the FBI through its Cyber ALAT program. We have um, dedicated and uh, experienced and expert FBI agents out in countries across the world, in Europe, as you mentioned, but also um, in Asia, in Australia, um, up in Canada, and we have plans to uh, expand that program. It's critically important to have folks on the ground in those countries making those relationships uh, stronger every day. Um, we also have our iChip network. This is a group of prosecutors who are also out uh, working um, uh, day in, day out with partners around the world. Um, and we, because everything in Washington needs a good acronym, we have our COIL. <laughs> um, this is uh, a particular prosecutor who is in charge of our cyber operations uh, internationally. She's our cyber operations international liaison um, and I think works every day to try to cement those relationships and grow them. And at the end of the day, that is what has been enabled us to, to be um, successful and on our front foot for, uh, recently 
um, in bringing some of these disruption actions where you don't just have folks uh, taking down servers and arresting bad actors in the United States, but as took place this week in our Genesis market case, you've got folks taking those kinds of actions across the globe, um, uh, all simultaneously and coordinated. Um, that's how you're able to really take the fight to cyber criminals and cyber threat actors is by calling upon those relationships which have to be built over, over many years before you're able to execute the kind of uh, coordinated takedown that we did earlier this week. So we do have plans to expand some of those programs. We, the, the, as you mentioned uh, in Pillar 5 and um, Nate mentioned earlier, um, this is a big part of uh, growing um, our capabilities and implementing the strategy is um, deepening those relationships. I'll say one more thing, which is I think we've all experienced in the cyber world that when people experience cyber attacks, whether it's companies, whether it's individuals, whether it's nation states, um, they're at their most vulnerable. And when we as a government can help those folks at that moment, that's an incredible relationship building opportunity. And so the FBI has cyber action teams that are like go teams ready to uh, move to any part of the globe to help uh, an ally or a partner or a potential ally or partner or respond to an attack. Um, and we've been successful um, in doing that in countries um, across the globe. Uh, recently, Montenegro, Costa Rica, other countries that have, we've been able to help them when they're at their most vulnerable, and that's a great way to um, not only defend uh, and disrupt, but also build build uh, alliances and relationships. I like that long-term thinking, right? So we've got to be taking an arc that's much more than just immediate, urgent operational need. Um, and in that line, I want to come back to, to all four of you and thinking about your own trajectory to this spot where you're doing some very interesting things with some very cool agencies. Uh, one of the themes coming out of the early open sessions for the National Cyber Workforce Strategy is this emphasis on more than just technical skills, but policy and governance skills, and really emphasizing skills over just credentials. I wonder if each of you could reflect for a moment on how your career brought you to this place, two of you coming out of military service in particular, and what's one piece of advice you might give to anybody in the room who would like to be sitting up here from intern to cyber ambassador for the United States in just a few short years? And why don't we go down the line from Marshall to Kemba? Sure. Well, <clears throat> I come to uh, this position really as a, as a generalist, as a prosecutor. I grew up as a prosecutor understanding um, how to bring federal criminal cases. Um, and um, then as threats evolved, moving into the terrorism space, when that was, I think, the, the emerging threat after 9-11 that uh, our Department of Justice needed to um, move to be more effective in, in, a, in uh, um, disrupting and um, deterring to the cyber threat. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think um, for me, it was about uh, on the job training essentially and using the skills that I built in other aspects of what the Department of Justice did and then um, learning what I needed to know on the cyber front to be able to add to that. Um, we were lucky enough though to have folks who are now trained uh, initially in cyber technical skills and then move into the prosecution. So I think for us, we need both. We need folks who master the, the key prosecutorial or investigative skills for our bureau and other law enforcement agencies in this space, and then learn cyber um, to, to add to that skill set. Um, but we also need folks who come with the technical skills to be able to make that team that we need in order to be effective. Um, so I think from my perspective, I had one piece of advice, it would be just to never stop learning. Um, and never stop um, looking for your career from a career perspective at what the next um, challenge is that faces your agency, the government, the, the country, um, and, and growing to meet it. Yeah, um, so as you said, I started off in the military, uh, engineering degree at a little school on the Hudson, uh, and then my master's degree in philosophy. So I did not really get into this field until uh, I went to NSA. And when I found myself actually in Iraq in 2006 as a brand new lieutenant colonel, uh, as the chief of our cryptologic services group with the mission to uh, help enable and implement uh, teams from NSA all throughout Iraq, and then operate, operationalize a new high technology system known as real-time regional gateway. Uh, and it was the idea that we were going to bring the power of the National Security Agency down to the troops. NSA had always been never say anything, no such agency, behind the green door. And, and uh, Keith Alexander, who was the director, really wanted to make sure that his West Point classmate, Dave Petraeus, had what he needed uh, to be able to uh, deal with a very difficult situation uh, in Iraq. And so it was an opportunity to see at that point in time the 
power of technology, really the power of imagination in using some of these technology capabilities to make a real difference on the ground in a significant way and to help save lives. And that, to me, was kind of an epiphany about some of these capabilities. And then after that, I was asked, uh, asked to stand up the Army's first cyber battalion and then work with Paul Nakasone and TJ White on the stand up of Cyber Command and then uh, found myself in the private sector at Morgan Stanley and then back here at CISA. Um, you know, I, I could never fail to take the opportunity to do a bit of a recruiting pitch, uh, Trey. So, uh, of course, at CISA, we are looking for technical experts, but we're looking for people who are engaged in policy and communications and uh, human resources uh, and other operational risk management. And so we are really building a different type of agency, which is not a government bureaucracy, but really something that's much more like a public-private collaborative where building trust and ensuring that we are always adding value and being transparent and being responsive uh, is the, um, the name of the game. And so if people want to come join us, um, we provide flexibility. We have a great culture. Uh, so I would say uh, reach out to our teams and uh, come join the Defense of America. So like Jen, I started in uniform. Uh, I was a Marine infantry officer. So uh, my only interaction with technology was banging the radio with a rock when it didn't work. <laughs> so uh, I was a long way from this domain. Um, I got an MBA, uh, and then I was in a bunch of different leadership jobs. I ran a nonprofit. Um, I started and grew a, a small technology company that became a big technology company, and I, I ran a chunk of a public technology company uh, before coming back into public service. And um, where, by the way, I, I skip into the office in the morning because it feels so good, like the, the palpable sense of being part of something that's uh, bigger than you and important. Uh, I had felt it as a junior officer in the military, uh, and it's, it's good to recapture it here now. Um, the, the comment that I would make is that uh, I, I think in this area in particular, uh, if you agree with the proposition that I started with, that technology innovation is likely to be the foundational source of national power in the foreseeable future, uh, then we need technology business people who are public-minded, uh, and we need people in government who have commercial sensibility, <laughs> because the two things have to work together. Uh, and so I'm a, I'm a proponent of careers that, that sort of work along that scene. And uh, I think ideally what it can give you is binocular vision, rather than you know, looking, looking through the proverbial soda straw, you can kind of see, see both. Um, so so my, my advice is, uh, may, maybe try to try to weave back and forth, but uh, if you are building a private sector technology career, please do consider giving some portion of your time and energy back uh, to public service because we need you. We writ large need you, and uh, and I think this the it, it really is fulfilling. Well, I'll, I'll start with the advice and then give you my my rundown of my career. My advice is that. Uh, absolutely anyone that wants to do cybersecurity should do cybersecurity, absolutely full stop. Doesn't matter what your background is. We, we need all of your experience, all of your perspective in it. Um, I read a book last year, Code Girls, that came out a few years ago. <clears throat> they recruited cryptologists that were women because it was tedious for, uh, I don't know, for others. Um, they recruited musicians, for example, because they could see patterns, right? So just. My advice is it doesn't matter what your discipline is, it doesn't matter what your curiosities are, bring all of it to cyber. There is some there is space for you. So here's my career. Um, <clears throat> I started off, I got my bachelor's degree in political science after trying out uh, biomedical engineering and realizing I did not like organic chemistry. Um, I, so I did that at Hampton University, a historically black university, and then went to uh, Princeton to get my master's in public affairs focused on international development. Um, decided not to go to Bosnia-Herzegovina at the time in the mid-90s and instead went to Tbilisi in the mid-90s, Georgia under Shevard Nazi, and did uh, development work. I was program manager. I wrote grants uh, mostly related to microfinance. At the time, that was development was focused on microfinance, community development, um, some conflict resolution of Khazia and in South Ossetia work. Uh, and then decided to come back to the United States to be in the headquarters of that nonprofit and focused on West Africa. Um, over time, I realized that international development works in hand with macro uh, economic issues, macro development issues, 
that development were, really wasn't going to take hold well unless people felt safe and secure. So I decided to take the easy route. Um, instead of getting a PhD in economics, I went to law school uh, at Georgetown uh, in, the, in the late 90s. Gosh, I'm, I can't believe I've been here for that long. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and turns out I was a pretty good lawyer, ended up clerking on, on the Fifth Circuit in, in Louisiana, um, practiced law at a white shoe law firm for a little while and decided to get back to my roots, which was international uh, development. So I did that in the form of international trade at Commerce as a trade remedies lawyer. Again, did not like it. I liked it as about as much as I liked organic chemistry. Uh, and went to uh, another law firm and focused on national security law. So in the form of CFIUS, Team Telecom, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, the EAR, the ITAR export controls, uh, did that for a while and was one of those unicorns that applied on USA Jobs for a job at the Department of Homeland Security. Wow. Cold, got it. And so uh, you're the one. I'm the one. <laughs> uh, and went to Homeland Security in 2009 in a variety of roles. I started there. Um, running what was then known as Team Telecom on behalf of DHS, which is looking at national security concerns on foreign investment and, and FCC licensing at the request of the FCC. Um, did a stint in uh, cargo security and transportation security around the time that we went and got bin Laden, but then uh, was the full-on lawyer for Jay Johnson on all CFIUS matters. The cases that were the most interesting in CFIUS were those that were related to cybersecurity. So, um, I ended up, because I was bothering uh, NP, what was known as NPPD then, I won't go through the acronym, now known as CISA, was bothering them so much that they said, look, you should just come work for us. Leave. <laughs> so I went there uh, as, as a lawyer focused on the financial sector, the critical infrastructure sector, energy, because those were two complex sectors and I understood how to read a balance sheet and how the financial sector worked from my work in CFIUS. Uh, uh, and then they gave me a collateral duty on the side in 2015 to focus on election security, uh, which is how I met Chris Krebs, and I was his lawyer uh, then, and in some ways still am, um, and, and on election security and cybersecurity. Uh, and then was recruited out of uh, CISA to Microsoft, uh, where they called and asked, do you want to be the lawyer that defends democracy? Yes. <laughs> and uh, there's no other answer to that. 2020 elections were deemed secure, and then Microsoft asked me to stand up the ransomware program in the Digital Crimes Unit, which I did until the White House called. And, uh, and that's also a call you don't say no to. Uh, but all it, So that's a long story, but I thought since we have interns in the room that I would go through the entire story only to tell you that cybersecurity was not a discipline when any of us were in school. I am so thrilled that it is a discipline now, so I can only imagine what amazing things you're going to do in the future, but bring your whole self, bring all of your experiences. Had you asked me, um, even five years ago, was I gonna end up in the White House as the National Cyber Director, I would have probably chuckled. Um, my brother, though, says I knew that was gonna happen. Um, but it's, it's, it's outstanding how much we, so, Cyber is not just, I have no engineering in my background, no military experience in my background. Uh, and to be sure, there are, there's space for technology, technologists in this space, uh, but we need just as much work in the people part of cyberspace and in the policy, the doctrine, the process uh, part of cyberspace. All of it requires us. It has been my mission to take cybersecurity out of the white ivory tower and distribute it to the rest of the world because it is everybody's business. It underpins everything that we do these days. So just go for it. I really, Can yeah. I just add one thing? please, yeah, yeah. I think one thing that seems to bind all this together, I think, is <laughs> the sense of mission that I think you can yeah. get from the, the cybersecurity space, mm -hmm. but also from government service. And I think it's, it's sort of the one item that I think bonds all those stories together. And I think that's what makes uh, working in this area so fruitful and so rewarding. Um, and it, you know, getting to come to work every day and go after cyber criminals and uh, figure out how to dislodge um, botnets from networks and help uh, victims um, gets everybody up in the morning uh, and makes you skip to work, as, yeah. as Nate said. I, the mission piece is interesting because it's, as I think elucidated by all four of you, it's large and small, mm -hmm. right? It's some of these tactical specific engagements. It's these broad strategic efforts. But I like that notion of distributed. Right, the cybersecurity question is not just for you four, not, not just for the folks here on stage. 
Um, Thank God. And I know, and so I, I think <laughs> that's one of the things we've heard a lot about from the strategy, from Congress, from the EU in the last two years, is the security of digital infrastructure. And there's a tendency to make that a very august, centralized, kind of elite politics topic. But one of the issues that we've been focused on here, and it comes out in the strategy, is the security of infrastructure that's actually developed by communities, thinking about open source software in particular, and trying to limit the harmful burden of either new regulatory approaches or new strategic approaches on them. I'm curious if we could talk a little bit about, for, for Gen Innate in particular, where your organizations are interacting with this open source security problem. Gen, CIS has announced, it's actually hiring an open source security lead, which made a number of us in the room incredibly excited. Can we expect to see more programming and programmatic support for open source from CISA in the future? So are you interested in that? <laughs> <laughs> I may be the second on USA Jobs, yeah. we'll have to see. Um, and anybody who is interested, uh, please reach out. Uh, we've got a terrific guy, Jack Cable, who's working on these issues. Obviously, open source uh, software and the entire ecosystem is incredibly important. The government is one of the largest uh, users of that, and you know we have a uh, requisite investment in ensuring the security and the resilience and the sustainability of the open source ecosystem. So we are hiring for a lead, which we're excited about, but we're also doing a bunch of other things. If you had a chance to look at our joint cyber defense collaborative planning agenda, we have a whole project that's focused around how do we identify and then mitigate risks in particular from open source software to industrial control systems. Obviously a huge focus on that across the board. Uh, and operational technology, also looking at prevalence of uh, open source within the federal enterprise and critical infrastructure. So again, we can uh, assess uh, and mitigate those risks. We're also looking at ways to harden open source uh, uh, ecosystems. So things like movement to memory safe code. We did a, uh, a speech up at Carnegie Mellon uh, recently to talk about the importance of instantiating more memory safe uh, programming into college curriculum. That's incredibly important for the uh, open source piece of this. Also looking for things like uh, the Coordinated Develop uh, Vulnerability Disclosure Program. We run that for the government, so on open source. And then of course we're working with Kemba's office and OMB and then OpenSSF, the open uh, open uh, Software Security Foundation uh, to try and move the ball on all of this, just given the incredible importance. We, we don't want to inhibit, we want to enable so that we can continue to drive innovation uh, through open source. But one of the things that we are trying to make progress on is on software repositories and um, package managers. It's really, really important when you think about uh, how package managers, people can get their uh, open source software and libraries, they have to be upgraded. So there's still an ability to, down, uh, to download vulnerable and even malicious uh, code from these. So making sure that package managers uh, mandate that maintainers have multi-factor authentication, that you can actually uh, ensure that um, when you put libraries on there that they are updated and upgraded with the latest security. So that's incredibly important and something we're trying to move the ball on this year. So, but, you know, but I would say is this is a community, like most things that we deal with at CISA, it's all about bringing together the power of the community. We don't have law enforcement or badges. We're not intel collectors. We're not military. We're not a regulator. We're really about how do we ignite the power of the community to actually advance um, security for, you know, arguably one of the most important ecosystems that we have to power the federal government and critical infrastructure. Really like that emphasis on communities. And I think to your point, some broader software security challenges, but areas where we could better resource some of these open source communities and support the kind of work that they're doing. Nate, I'm curious, so many of these communities are global, right? They're not strictly mapped to particular country boundaries. And we've seen interest, especially from the EU in trying to actually fund and support some of these programs. I'm curious, where do you see for CDP and for state in the next three to four years, open source playing a role in some of those mm -hmm. transatlantic, especially conversations? Yeah, so you're, you're singing my song here, Trey, because uh, the company I built was an open source security company and, and became the foundation for uh, a, a, an open source security company. The software has been doubted, downloaded more than a billion times globally. Uh, I'm a big believer in, in this. Um, I think that there's a, there's a powerful uh, democratizing element of it that makes sophisticated, sophisticated capability more accessible uh, to people globally. And ultimately, uh, with the right controls in place over time, I would put my security bet 
on a community rather than a small team of engineers behind a wall, no matter how good that, that team is. So kind of at the, at the philosophical level, I do think this is the future. Um, I think we're in the early stages still of, a, of an open wave in, in uh, technology broadly. We see it not only in the security software stack, but we see it uh, in telecommunications. So um, the, the, the beginning of the popularization of open radio access networks to disaggregate these vertically integrated uh, telco stacks and introduce innovation at every layer of the stack, maybe we can even do the unimaginable and bring venture capital back to telecommunications uh, by breaking it apart uh, in enough, disaggregating it in enough ways that you can actually, actually, actually fuel, you know, yeah, technology innovation at the different at the different layers of the of the telco uh, stack, which would be, I think, extraordinarily good for uh, users, extraordinarily good for the security of the ecosystem, the diversity of the ecosystem as a whole, and to get to your question now, to land the plane, make all of this more accessible to to broader groups uh, around the world, because. Um, we often talk about the asymmetry of cybersecurity in, in, a, in, a, um, in a way that's negative, right? We talk about the, the fact that uh, a relatively small number of nefarious actors with relatively little funding can put the stick in the spokes of our big complex uh, enterprises. But the inverse is also true. Um, relatively low investments in security capability can generate uh, outsized capacity. And that's a message that I try to drive home all around the world. Small countries, uh, countries with relatively low budgets in this area, can indeed become net exporters of security. Uh, and open source is a part of making that capability more accessible to them. That accessibility piece is interesting. I like the the stick in the, the, the wheel, though. That spoke is going to stick in my mind. So, <laughs> Kemba, I actually want to come back to you on the complexity piece because there was a really interesting proposal in the strategy specifically to potentially hold vendors of software liable mm -hmm. for flaws in how they're building their code. Um, strategy does a nice job carving out saying these burdens shouldn't fall on open source developers, but rather I think on those entities that fail to take reasonable precautions. Mm -hmm. We know there's going to be, or we should say we might imagine there's going to be pushback to this from vendors who feel like they've gotten used to exercising a little bit less care over how they develop code. I think we had one gentleman mention that we should only be worried about fly-by-night companies. We don't have to worry about the big vendors. How do you want to set the table for this kind of negotiation, given how important this issue is? Look, it's, it's we've done this before. Um, we've done it in auto manufacturing before. We can't allow the end user to be held liable for flaws in code. It's just that simple. Um, in the auto manufacturing space, and it was you know, in the early 1900s, you could buy a car and something was, went wrong with it and you would go back to the car dealer and it was something wrong with your tire and they would say, we're not, we're not responsible for it, it's the tire dealer, well then you have to go. It made it very complicated. Um, at the end of the day, we now have a regime where the final assembler is li held liable. Um, we do the same thing in food, right? We have food safety measures. Uh, there might be some safe harbor in that space where you can have a little bit of rat hair <laughs> in your food, um, but that you're held liable if you have the whole rat, right? Like, that's gross, but it's, it's true, right? <laughs> um, so we've, it's not easy. We've done this before, um, but the, the ultimate idea, and I think Jen said it once in one of her talks, is that we've, we can't normalize patching all the time. We've got the you know, Tuesday patch. To, like that's not, that's not reasonable. That's not exercising a duty of care. Um, we've got to inject. Now it's going to take some time to do this. We want to do it right. We have to be thoughtful about it. Um, and we have to think not just about duty of care and imposing liability, but what are the safe harbors going to look like in this space? I don't have the answer yet but I'm very excited about this part of the strategy because I think this is one of those tools that we haven't really leaned into that's bold, that will actually make a difference. It will, it's a multi-stakeholder, multi-year exercise. I posit that we will also need Congress's help, um, but I think it's, it's doable. We'll get there. It, Can I just add please? to that? Because I, I just think this is so fundamentally yeah. important and something that we've not talked about before. We have for years accepted 
software and technology that is insecure by design. And why is that? It's not because you know these software makers are bad people. <laughs> They're incredibly innovative and smart and creative people. But at the end of the day, the incentives were completely misaligned. The incentives are about reducing cost and speed to market and cool features. They just were not about safety and security. And because everything now has a technology backbone, all critical infrastructure is underpinned by technology, whether that's information technology or operational technology, we have to make this fundamental difference. You know, I am, I am, uh, I always go back to Ralph Nader's book, 1965, uh, you know, un unsafe at any speed, and think about it, uh, unsafe at any CPU speed. At the end of the day, that was 1965. It took until 1983 to get legislation for for seat belts. Mm -hmm. you know, we cannot wait that long for the technology that we use and rely upon every hour of every day to be inherently unsafe. Okay. This is interesting, because given the prominence of the issue, and to your point, I think the potential role for Congress, I want to I want to ask actually Marshall about a program that the strategy calls out the DOJ has in place to actually hold companies accountable, specifically vendors to the federal government. I believe it's the Civil Fraud Initiative. Hold accountable entities or individuals that put U.S. information or systems at risk by knowingly providing deficient cybersecurity products or services. I would be curious to know what would you need in terms of clarity on a standard of care or duty of care to use CCFI to start to hold companies that are vending to the federal government liable for defects in their software development process, say, in the next year? Well, we're already um, uh, moving out on the Civil Cyber Fraud Initiative. Um, it was launched by our Deputy Attorney General back in October 2021. As I think it has a lot uh, in common with what we've been talking about uh, um, during the last couple minutes, which is the idea is to um, hold accountable those who are uh, capable uh, and have the resources to invest uh, and protect um, and also um, take advantage of uh, one element of the federal government's power. We talk a lot about using all instruments of power here to attack this problem. One is our procurement authorities and capabilities and being able to drive innovation, being able to drive security through holding accountable those who come to the federal government and uh, contract with the federal government or vend to the federal government. Um, and so the idea of the initiative uh, is using a very old law, the False Claims Act, which was passed back in the Civil War era, um, to ensure that uh, anyone who defrauded the government during that um, uh, difficult time was held accountable and use it today in uh, 21st century America. So that's the concept. Um, we're already doing it. I think it's holding folks to, for example, uh, requirements that are um, in some of the federal regulatory code already regarding um, uh, having to disclose uh, uh, incidents and disclose um, uh, areas of deficiency. Um, and it also um, requires uh, certain standards of care, as you said. And so I think we, all of that can be handled for the, through this initiative through contracting power. Um, so we don't have to have, we can through contracts and smart contracting set standards of care even if they're not universal. Um, so it is a tool, um, but it is only one tool and it just becomes part of the broader ecosystem of ways that we need to address the problem. Interesting, so maybe we start to see action on this in a phased way without necessarily having to wait for the, the silver bullet from Congress, which is exciting. Um, we're gonna do two more questions up here and then we wanna go to the room and for those of you online, so start thinking, start turning. For those of you who are here, we have a microphone over here on the, the stage right side. We'd ask you to come and queue up there and we'll take questions as we go. Um, to this group, before we wrap up, the national cyber strategy does address the proliferation of spyware, but of course in the last couple of weeks, We've seen an executive order and a fairly groundbreaking uh, statement together with a number of international partners. Um, the strategy highlights that these tools and services allow groups that previously lack capability to harm U.S. interests. And the president told us that countering this proliferation was a fundamental national security and foreign policy interest. Marshall, to start with you, where does spyware fit into GOJ's disruption activities, thinking about pillar two of the strategy? How will the departmental approach to spyware change in response to the strategy? <clears throat> well, I think I think there are probably a couple ways that we interact with spyware um, uh, uh, at on the law enforcement level. One is just by going after uh, criminals who misuse spyware to target individuals and companies and and nation states for that matter, um, and break the law um, by uh, um, uh, using it to invade folks' privacy, um, using it to uh, steal. Uh, PII, um, using it essentially to commit different forms of identity theft or um, 
a cyber crime. So that's one uh, area that we interact with it. The other area is ensuring that we, as uh, a law enforcement community, uh, an intelligence community, uh, of which DOJ is also part, um, live up to the uh, basic principles of the country and our commitment to uh, ensuring that we're not um, buying uh, and, and or licensing sp uh, spyware products um, that uh, cut against our values, that are used either by adversaries um, to engage in um, illegal or, um, or uh, you know, other kinds of activities that would run against our core principles, um, or by used in ways that uh, you know, actually uh, cause a national security risk to the country. So that's the principle of it, and we certainly um, uh, um, believe in that, both at the principled level and in terms of the way that the execution will, will play out um, as it goes into effect. I appreciate that. Jen, I'm curious your take on this issue. One of the recurring pieces of the spyware debate is obviously impact on technology users, especially government users. Where do you see CISA's work on Secure by Design playing a role in that debate, potentially starting to raise the profile of this issue even further? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a role, but the thing that I'm most excited about, frankly, um, and it was announced last week, is our work uh, with high-risk communities. So we, we mentioned this in our JCDC planning agenda, um, and we announced it at the Summit for Democracy last week, but we have a whole effort focused around uh, civil society. We know that civil society is targeted by authoritarian governments who want to stifle free speech and democratic values. And so one of the things that we want to do through our Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative is work with civil society and governments uh, as well as technology companies to understand the threats that civil society has to deal with from things like spyware and cybersecurity threats and then develop and implement joint cyber defense plans. So we're already having these conversations with civil society about the threats that we face, the threats that they face, what we can do to mitigate them, uh, how we amplify the best practices. So excited about that. And for those of you who didn't see the Summit for Democracy, there's a great panel uh, with my secretary, with the DNI, but also John Scott Railton from Citizen Lab talking about this, which I thought was fabulous. We're doing two other things. We're working with the UK as part of the strategic dialogue and other like-minded partners. I'm sure my buddy Nate will be part of that. Again, international cooperation to deal with the threats that civil society and frankly, other vulnerable populations like cybersecurity researchers or journalists have to deal with. So excited about that. And then finally, um, our Technology Council, which is a subcommittee on our cybersecurity advisory board, it's led by uh, Jeff Moss, is looking at this issue and making recommendations. And we have some fantastic experts on this, people like Runa Sandvik, uh, Rachel Toback, Dina Dizovi, who are going to help us really get this right. So. I think that initiative will, one, will be one of the areas that we can really make some great progress on, again, working with the community. I like to, it's helpful to hear there's both a domestic and an international component to that, so appreciate it. All right, one final question to you before we go to the room. So if you want to start queuing up, now's the moment. There's a growing mountain of work in cybersecurity policy. I'd say this space has been more active in the last year than it's been in the previous five, which is exciting, but definitely has everybody uh, you know, keeping pace and, and struggling to do so. Recognizing the strategy has helped to kick off an important set of debates amidst and on top of that mountain of work, and recognizing that none of you will get to see these efforts through entirely their fruition. I'm curious, what's one piece of advice you'd give your successor about the way that you are framing or prioritizing work under this strategy for maximum impact? And Kemba, I wonder if we could start with you. Ooh, um, you know, I'm just, I'm the recent successor, <laughs> so <laughs> within a month. Um, I think I would start with lean heavily uh, on your interagency partners, private sector, academia, and civil society as you drive implementation. Understand that implementation is a dynamic process. Um, there is not an end, right? We're trying to make our system defensible and resilient and aligned with our values. That is an iterative process. So lean on interagency partners, ONCD in particular, our superpower from my perspective are the people in our agency that we have, we're 80 strong, all leaders, all in their own right um, geniuses on something, um, but also doers. And so for my specific successor, I would say lean on your people power in your organization. So those are the three like pieces I would. I think we need to frame what we're trying to do here in affirmative terms. We, it's incumbent on us to articulate a positive, compelling, attractive uh, vision for what our shared global technology future can be. 
uh, build a coalition, the broadest possible coalition around that, sustain and defend the areas of advantage that are wellsprings of our power in this area, and then, and then build the organizational capacity inside our government, inside our agencies, to sustain what is likely to be a generational strategy. And so my plea to my successor uh, will be uh, maintain that internal focus too. Don't forget the need to continue modernizing our own institutions, uh, attracting the kind of talent we need, promoting the kind of talent we need, retaining the kind of talent we need, and changing the, the funding processes and the organizational structures um, in order to ensure that we can continue ad to adapt at the speed that these technologies are changing. Um, well, I think anybody who, who aspires to take this job has to fundamentally understand this job is about partnerships and the most important currency is trust. So trust with your federal teammates, state and local, with industry, and you build trust through transparency, and you build trust through listening, and you build trust through treating feedback as a gift. So kind of goes back to a little bit of the people uh, part of this. But from a, from a strategic perspective, I think we need a new approach that is sustainable. We are not in a world where we can continue to do what we're doing, and the national cyber st strategy really reflects the two big changes. But what we are focused on this year and in the out years is the technology safety piece that we think is fundamental, ensuring that the technology we all rely upon is both secure by design and secure by default, ensuring that businesses large and small embrace corporate cyber responsibility as a matter of good governance, and then finally, catalyzing persistent collaboration, this transformation from plain old hackneyed public-private partnerships to true real-time operational collaboration where you have a default to share, essentially, where you see the government and industry as co-equal partners with a reciprocal responsibility for transparency and value added, uh, and where you have the right platform so that you can share in real time uh, to be able to take advantage of uh, data analysis. And we're working through that as our joint uh, cyber environment. And so these are the things that I hope we can continue to sustain to really make progress in a world where we don't worry so much about asymmetry of capability. We, work, uh, we worry about asymmetry of ethics because the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians and the North Koreans will do things to our civilian and critical infrastructure that we frankly wouldn't do, and we're seeing that in Ukraine right now. So we don't have a lot of time to lose, which is why implementation under the leadership of our fearless NCD uh, is so important. Appreciate that. Um, I, I think the advice I would give would be to um, innovate to meet the moment. Um, so at DOJ, I think uh, over the last couple of years, we've really tried to rethink how we can use our tools and authorities most effectively. Um, to, to be part of this uh, interagency team, be part of this overall collaborative effort to attack the threat. Um, and that, for us, has meant rethinking what was a decades, if not century-old strategy of solving crime and prosecuting criminals and thinking about how to use our authorities and our capabilities to take the fight to the adversary, um, to disrupt, deter, detect, um, and dismantle um, rather than solve crimes after they've been committed. And that's required a whole new way of thinking in terms of how to do so using lawful authorities, how to do so using um, relationships, uh, how, to, how to better interact with the public to better protect victims proactively. Um, and I think what we're starting to see, just to take ransomware as an example, um, is data to reflect that that effort has resulted in increasing, although not high enough, but increasing victim reporting um, decreasing uh, ransomware payment numbers. Um, and we're starting to see that that effort to get on the front foot, take down um, uh, actors, even if we can't necessarily put cuffs on them and bring them to, to justice in an American courtroom, we're working with our foreign partners to do it abroad, and we're taking actions to take down uh, infrastructure um, of our adversaries to make it a costlier business to do cybercrime. Uh, and to um, increase the ability of victims and private sector to, to take steps working with law enforcement uh, to counteract cybercrime. 
I think we're looking forward to seeing all these efforts really sink into the agencies, but it's a, it's a credit to the NCD team. I think that the strategy has opened up the aperture of what we think about as cyber policy and cyber strategy conversations so remarkably. I don't think we've seen a document that natively integrates the private sector more effectively. So big thank you for that and to this group for your initial round of questions. To the floor, um, if I could ask quickly, one, that you keep your question brief and make sure that there's a question mark at the end of it, which I know sometimes is a challenge for the DC community. Uh, just let us know your name and affiliation as well. Ma'am, we'll start with you. Thanks. Um, Juliana Vida. I'm with Splunk. I'm the Chief Strategy Advisor for our public sector. Um, my question is, what can the panel talk about in terms of reducing or lowering the barriers um, from the industry side to check the boxes, make it through the requirements that are on us for software, specifically FedRAMP? It can be very costly, time consuming, frustrating to be wanting to do the right thing to be a good corporate citizen, to be have cyber responsibility, and then waiting weeks, months, just for a response from the office that we submitted the package to. So, and that's just one barrier to, um, to partnership. So is there dialogue? Are there discussions ongoing to help industry do the things that government is requiring us to do to be good partners? One or two folks want to take that? Oh, I can start. Um, so I'll, I'll start with, a couple of comments. And the strategy in, in Pillar 1, and I'm going to make it short, in Pillar 1 we talk a bit about using some of our regulatory authorities in order to be able to shift this balance. Um, but we do it in three parts. They're co-equal. One is to harmonize the regulatory burden, find reciprocity where we can, um, find gaps where we're not using our regulatory authority to raise the cybersecurity requirements for those that aren't that aren't really investing in cybersecurity. Um, but as we do that, doing it in full consultation with both regulators and industry that has to bear that burden. On FedRAMP specifically, I understand the challenges. So does GSA. I've spoken to her, the administrator. Um, so we are working through that, that particular complication together uh, with the ATOs and the time and the delay that it takes. Uh, so we acknowledge that. And the more we hear from practitioners, the better we can serve practitioners, so we've heard it loud and clear, and we're trying to find an opportunity. The other pet rock, as my staff likes to talk uh, to, to me about, uh, that I have is not just harmonizing regulations, but harmonizing standards in general. I think there's a lot of work to be done so that we invest properly in cybersecurity and rather than compliance or ATOs or whatever it is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Joseph Roskop with the Washington College of Law. Um, I was, full disclosure, recently described as having an unhealthy obsession with CISA. I <laughs> only mention that because I don't want to yep. preclude involvement from the rest of the panel. But um, I was curious. CISA is mentioned quite a bit in the strategy. Uh, the strategy also emphasizes using existing legal authorities to kind of see this mission through. Um, with some of the rapid advancements in AI technology is in the kind of unforeseen ways that they might be implemented, both in critical infrastructure, but might frankly make all of your lives a little bit harder. Um, to what degree do you feel existing legal authorities are sufficient to realize the mission or the vision kind of articulated in the strategy? I mean, I'm happy to start, and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards if you still have your unhealthy obsession, but we dress a little bit more downscale. <laughs> so, um, can I take your question in a slightly different direction? Because I think this is a piece of the technology conversation that we're having, right? You go back to the original sin of the wonderful internet, right? It was not created with security in mind. Then we went to software, and the incentives were not about security or safety. And so we created a multi-billion dollar cybersecurity industry to bolt on, create greater complexity to try and deal with unsafe technology. Then we had social media of moving fast and breaking things, and we're breaking the mental health of our kids. And then we are at AI. And so we are hurtling forward in a way that I think is not the right level of responsibility, uh, implementing AI capabilities in production uh, without any legal barriers, without any regulation. And frankly, I'm not sure that we are thinking about the downstream safety consequences of how fast this is moving and how bad people like terrorists, which I used to be the head of counterterrorism at the White House, or cyber criminals, or adversary nation states can use some of these capabilities, not for the amazing things that 
uh, they can do, but for some really bad things that can happen, weaponization of cyber, a weaponization of genetic engineering, weaponization of biotech. And so I have been um, trying hard to think about how we can implement certain controls around how this technology starts to proliferate in a very accelerated way. I think this is the biggest issue that we're going to deal with this century. If you think about the most powerful weapons of the last century was nuclear weapons. They were controlled by governments, and there was no incentive to use them. There was a disincentive to use them. These are the most powerful technology capabilities and maybe weapons of this century. And we do not have the legal regimes, to your question, or the regulatory regimes to be able to implement them safety, safely and effectively. And we need to figure that out in the very near term. Okay. Can I just add an, uh, so yes to all of that. And I'm also obsessed with CISA, <laughs> even though I'm the National Cyber Director. You never um, really leave CISA. I know you never just really forward leave. deploy. You're, you jumped in, you're, you, know, you have to be jumped out. I haven't been jumped out. But I'm the National Cyber Director. So I'll, let me give you a framework to think about it as a law student, um, AI. And I look, at, I look at cybersecurity, not just as national security, issue. It's a tech innovation uh, opportunity, economic development opportunity, social justice opportunity. So I think about AI from a cybersecurity perspective in that tech innovation bucket. AI is divided into three pieces in my mind. You've got data, which fuels AI. And how do we think about data security? How, where are we getting our data from? How are we analyzing data? Can we use homomorphic encryption to do so or some other type of encryption to analyze it without decrypting it or putting people's data at risk? So data fuels it. The compute power, how are we thinking about computing? What are we thinking about in terms of quantum? I know we have NSM10 in, in our parlance thinking about quantum. How do, what do we think about compute power? How are we thinking about legislative boundaries around that? Uh, and then the intellectual property piece of it, the algorithms piece of it. From my perspective, coming from my experience, um, that algorithm piece of it is, uh, what are we doing with security by design, software, software development security? Um, but it's also a people issue. And how do we think about people who's, who's developing the algorithm? How are we training them? What are their skill sets? Um, but if you break it down in its parts, um, from a cybersecurity perspective, I break it down in those parts. I'm sure there are other parts of it that I'm not thinking of from other perspectives. Uh, then you can start really thinking about what the legal framework should look like around AI. I don't have the answer, but I have a framework for thinking about it. That's useful. Sounds like a student note to be written. <laughs> Sir, you. Thank you. Uh, David Berto, PSC. And Trey, I want to put in a plug for young people who are looking to be on the platform one day. Come to as many think tank events as you can, including mm -hmm. those at the Atlantic Council. That's what I did. Uh, whether it's CNAS or CSIS or Heritage or Atlantic Council, you can cover the whole waterfront. That's what you ought to do. And introduce yourself to as many people as you can while you're here, except me. Um, so a strategy is only as good as its implementation and execution. And I know you guys are working on that execution or implementation guidance. Mm -hmm. In line with the questions we've just had already, how are you including all the non-government people in that process as you're developing that implementation and execution? Because there's lots and lots of hiccups that I learned when I was in the government. I thought I understood. Then when I came out, I realized I didn't understand at all. Right? And so how do you include that? And in, in that context, there's, we tend to think of cybersecurity as kind of nesting, right? At the middle is .mil and the Intel community and then .gov, then .com, et cetera. But no matter what your laws are, no matter what your regulations are, eventually, whether you're buying fuel to refuel a ship at a port, a foreign port, whether you're a State Department or USAID implementing partner operating in a country where your only telecom is Huawei, mm -hmm. you're going to be dealing with people who will never even read, much less want to comply with the standards that we're setting. So how do you incorporate that into your implementation and execution? Thank you. Big Tent wants to take that to start. I can, I can start since the, the last page of the strategy says that ONCD in collaboration with OMB will lead the implementation planning process. So I'll start. But uh, the, you know, the implementation planning, we didn't create the strategy in a bubble. Like we, we did that in full collaboration, full transparency. The implementation planning process is exactly the same way. And we're not doing this in a bubble. Um, as a practical matter, the action items in that implementation plan are going to fall heavily to departments and agencies. So we've been collaborating quite a bit with departments and agencies. There's a lot that, that didn't make it into the strategy that hit the cutting room floor, but it really hit 
um, our implementation plan spreadsheet. Uh, so, so we preserved all those actions. So we've been working on it. Workforce strategy, the digital skills strategy is one of those uh, pieces of implementation. We might publish RFIs when necessary to help uh, bring in industry support, particularly as it relates to liability or regulatory harmonization, all manner of things. Us engaging on a regular basis is part of that process. It's an iterative process and we will continue to make it iterative. And in the strategy, we do mention that it will be public. It will be transparent. Um, but I, I want to give my colleagues a Can chance. I, I'm happy, yeah, to, happy to jump in there on, on a couple of aspects. So I, I think uh, your, your point about multi-stakeholderism, which at least the State Department is our, our buzz term for including uh, non-governmental actors, is essential here for all the obvious reasons, right? The bulk of the talent, the bulk of the attack surface, uh, the bulk of the technology innovation, they all sit in the private sector. Uh, so one thing that we're trying to do is in our bilateral and multilateral dialogues around the world, by design, uh, we have representatives from companies and civil society at the table. So uh, they, they can't be brought in late in the game to sort of give a superficial wash or endorsement of policy development. They have to be there at the beginning uh, in the formulative stages. And so uh, that's kind of a key pillar of everything that we're trying to do. Um, I think you put your finger right on something that's uh, essential and, and too little discussed, which is the trustworthiness of infrastructure around the world. Mm -hmm. And that really does get to a, a foundational issue because we can be, we can be talking about security uh, at the top layer, but if, if the architecture is fundamentally untrustworthy, then we, we obviously have a big problem. So uh, as we think about uh, global ICT infrastructure, um, I'll tell you first, define it broadly. So this is cable and fiber. Uh, it's also wireless networks, it's satellites, and it's increasingly data centers and cloud services. Uh, and we have a robust diplomatic engagement strategy all around the world to try to ensure that our closest partners and allies use only trustworthy infrastructure. Uh, that is an uneven effort right now, I will tell you. It was telling that the cell tower on top of the Bayer Hof that hosted the Munich Security yeah. Conference had, had Huawei gear in it, yeah. right? We have a long way to go. Uh, and we have an especially long way to go across large swaths of the developing world. Uh, but we try to make the point to our partners that this is actually an inhibitor to information sharing, to intelligence sharing, and to collaboration. It's a foundational piece of, uh, of, of our bilateral and multilateral relationships. Um, I will say that uh, this gets back to the, the point of sustaining and defending advantage where we have it, because we used to have the advantage here and we lost it. Huawei ran the table globally, initially based on IP theft and, and decades of PRC subsidies of their business. Mm -hmm. But that catalyzed indigenous, indigenous innovation, uh, which is something that is uh, a reality now that we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to confront. And we need to confront it across not only telco, but every other technology era, area. So take it back to AI just for a second. Uh, I would argue that this is one of the very top priorities in terms of where we need to sustain and defend current advantage s precisely because of its generative quality. Mm -hmm. Building a faster missile doesn't beget a yet faster missile. Building a capable AI system does in fact beget an even more capable AI yeah. system. Mm -hmm. So early advantage compounds, early deficits compound. Yeah. Okay. Just one other thing on that. So CISA, which I'm also obsessed with, by the way. <laughs> um, so our mission is to lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk to the cyber and physical infrastructure Americans rely on every hour of every day. The vast majority of that infrastructure is not owned by the federal government. Mm -hmm. So everything we do, I probably spend 80% of my time with the private sector or state and local or nonprofits or civil society. And we are every day, day in, day out, and international partners working to get feedback, to ensure that as we develop standards and as we develop things like the cybersecurity performance goals, we are doing that in a very consultative way. And that's the way we plan to implement this. And frankly, this is not a, we're gonna go implement yeah. it done. We're in a constant uh, energy to, to implement the strategy. Iteration yet again. I'll sure. just add very quickly that I think um, from an implementation st uh, standpoint, we're not starting at ground zero. So a lot of what gets captured in these various pillars, I'll, I'll talk just about the pillars that I think DOJ is most involved in, pillar two, pillar five. Um, when it comes to disrupting and dismantling threat actors, big, the, the big picture item of pillar two, um, 
we're engaged every day with that process and we're leaning forward, we're being more proactive, we're being more disruptive than we've ever been as a, de as a department and as a government. And so we're not, if we're going from zero to 60, we're not at zero, mm -hmm. we're not at 60, but we're not starting from zero. And I think that's also true in the international arena in pillar five. We, we, yes, we need to continue to forge international partnerships, which is the pillar, but we have a lot to build on. And I think that's true across all the pillars. That's helpful. Let's go back to you, sir. Good morning, and thank you so much for sharing uh, today. I'm Joseph Schaefer, a professor at the National Defense University College of Information and Cyberspace. And I'm working on a framework for national security cyber policy. The idea is to gather and then publish the most essential elements of cyber that strategy and policy uh, makers need to understand. So I'd appreciate it if you could share with me what your couple of most important elements that policy and strategists need to know about cyber. Thank you. I mean, I think, again, I would take it back to the two fundamental precepts that are articulated in this strategy and what make it so game-changing and groundbreaking, that uh, the burden of security needs to be placed on those most able to bear it. Uh, and that we have to make long-term investments in the safety and security and resilience of our ecosystem. Those sound like somewhat obvious things, <laughs> uh, but frankly, that's where the pillars derive from. And anybody who is thinking about cyber policy, cyber strategy, I think coming down to two of those very simple but powerful tenets is what anybody in your business would, would want to use as sort of a rooting foundation. Helpful framing. I'll give you three, and then, because um, I, I, so I, I teach cybersecurity law and policy for graduate level course. It's a foundational course for cybersecurity risk managers. So the three things that I make sure that they leave the classroom with are, are quite simple. Um, so yes, the, the two shifts that's articulated in our strategy. Um, but the three concepts that I realize that they come to class not quite understanding, and these are graduate students, are that cyberspace is not just a technology. We mentioned this earlier. It's technology, people, and doctrine. I go through exactly what that means. So that's one framing piece. Um, moving away from the CIA triad, um, which is in that technology piece, but really thinking about in terms of the layers, the technology, the people, and the doctrine. So that's one. The other is that I, I really do a, a, I really need for people to understand what risk is um, and that risk is cyber looking at cybersecurity risk, it's really an exercise of mitigating risk. You don't get to zero, but risk is a marriage of threat, what that is, capability and intent, vulnerability, where you find the vulnerabilities, um, and the consequences, right? So really working that through, that's the, that's the second piece. The third piece is really focused on how we've constructed the strategy, and that is uh, that cybersecurity is subordinate to everything else. So cybersecurity enables everything that we want our digital ecosystem to be able to do. It is, it is uh, an all of humanity issue. It is not just a national security concern, which I know is your focus at National Defense University, um, but it's about tech innovation, it's about economic development, uh, but it is, it is at its core to help communities thrive. I'll give you the five pieces from the seat of the diplomat uh, and uh, first is articulate the positive, compelling, attractive vision because this can't just be anti-China or anti-Russia. Uh, we need a more persuasive posture for middle ground states to join us. Uh, second is build that coalition uh, bilaterally and multilaterally. We want, in the long term, the, the greatest number of people, the greatest cumulative GDP, the greatest number of innovative companies, the most collective R&D dollars. We need that on our collective side. That's number two. Number three is engage the United States hard in the multilateral fora where the norms and standards are set. Look, I'm sympathetic to the argument that the UN is slow and inefficient, that it might be better off if you cut the top half off the building. We hear that all the time. The problem is if the US does that unilaterally, all it means is others fill the void. So we have to engage hard in all of the fora where these norms and standards get established. Fourth is be deliberate about sustaining and defending the areas of advantage that we currently have. This is widen the aperture on cybersecurity. It's also about ICT. It's about the enabling technologies of 6G. 
It's about quantum science. It's about artificial intelligence. So where do we currently have advantage that we can sustain and defend? Uh, and then fifth, build the capacity to sustain what I think we think is going to be a generational strategy. It's not about the people on the stage here, the people in the room here, and it's not about our successors. It's about our successors, successors, successors. This is going to be a long-term game. Appreciate that. Marshall? I think um, what I would uh, point you towards is um, looking at the authorities we have and thinking a little bit about whether they can meet the moment, whether they need to be modernized, whether they need to be modernized just through the way we approach them or through um, some sort of legislation. Um, uh, you know, a good example here, uh, Kemba brought up the CFIUS process before. Right, the CFIUS process was uh, created with the idea of a foreign country buying a brick and mortar business. Do we want them to buy that brick and mortar business? Do we not? Is that near a, a military base? I mean, that's, that was the thought process when it was created. How can we use that CFIUS process to get at the real threat now, data security, just to, to take that as, since that's such a critical part of what we're talking about here. Um, does, does the tool work? Can we make it work? And if we can't, how, how can we modernize it um, from a legislative standpoint? I think we can, um, but and I think we can think about that across all kinds of authorities that defend our national security. So recognizing we're running up on our last 15 minutes together, and thank you, sir. Why don't we take two questions at a time, and we'll, we'll start to, so Chris, if you want to lead us off. Hi, uh, Chris Painter. I'm currently the president of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. It's a worldwide capacity building uh, coordination uh, group, but that was a long time uh, U.S. government uh, person in three of the, uh, sorry, Jen, I never made it to DHS, but three <laughs> other of the agencies there. Still time, Chris. So I, I foot stamp, stomp the idea that people should go into government. You may never leave if you go in, but go in. <laughs> uh, so just following up on your question, Trey, on capacity building in particular, and not on the cybersecurity part in particular, there is a huge demand for this. Countries around the world, especially in the developing world, are demanding this, yet the the resources and the priority don't match that demand. I appreciate the national strategy, or, uh, you know, putting this in as one of the footstops. I appreciate the support that both state and, and CISA has been giving, not just our organization, but this area. Uh, but the, the resources don't, just don't be demand. How can we, and Kemba, given your development uh, background, how can we mainstream this more to give this more priority and resources? Because I think it's foundational to both the good things we're trying to do and stopping the bad. So prioritizing capacity building and then you, sir, if we could take a second. Okay. Mark Troutman, Strategic Education International. Really a question in two parts and build on the resourcing theme. Um, first part of that question, the marginal dollar within the government, proverbial marginal dollar within the government, where does it go for the highest return? And second, and building on some of Marshall's uh, uh, comments, um, how much is created in the, in the private sector? So what would be the balance? How much within the government? How much within the, the private sector and where? And where would the marginal dollar within the government go for the highest return? Thanks. Right, so capacity building and prioritizing investment, who wouldn't want to start? Well, I'll start with the prioritizing investment because this is something that we are doing with respect to the federal civilian executive branch and the .gov. Uh, we started a program called Einstein many, many years ago. It was all about protecting uh, essentially the perimeter. One of the big things that we've been investing in over the past couple of years is significant modernization of that infrastructure moving from government capabilities uh, to commercial capabilities. There's been so much investment in this space. To me, uh, the services that we provide now should take advantage of the ingenuity and the innovation that the private sector has put into that. And as much as we can use those types of capabilities, that's what we're trying to move towards, frankly. And you can see it in our marketplace and our shared services. And that is actually um, creating much greater visibility for us to truly be able to manage the .gov as a federal enterprise in a way that we've never been able to do before. And so a lot of that is our transition strategy to commercial. I'll just give you a quick, quick answers to both questions. The first on uh, capacity building. In, at ONCD, we're focused on um, building digital skills. So we were, the strategy calls for a cyber workforce and education strategy. We've really rethought that in terms of skills, uh, being a skills builder, not just for those that are going to enter the cyber workforce as cyber and IT professionals, but digital literacy. I think I heard um, Nate mention digital skill building at the K through 12, uh, reskilling, upskilling as we build broadband out doing that across borders, finding the right taxonomy. Um, and then on the resourcing piece, one of the, one of the brilliant pieces of our statute 
ONCD statute that Congress and, uh, facilitated for us was that we have a, a, a mandate to align budget and align resources with the aspirations. So our implementation planning development process um, is co-chaired by two people on my staff, one who's focused on programs, the other who's focused on budget. Uh, but we've also been, we, we signed out a um, cyber priorities memo, budget memo, to inform how departments and agencies request cyber funding, um, signed out both by ONCD and OMB. Uh, and what uh, uh, Jen was talking about in terms of moving away from that perimeter security We've seen now the fruits of that cyber priorities uh, guidance. It's called spring guidance. In the president's budget, it's, there's a 3% increase over actual spend on cyber security. 15, I think, billion dollars of it is, is going towards zero trust architecture, for example. Uh, and so we are beginning to, we'll do that for 20, 2025 as well, a cyber priorities um, uh, spring guidance that's aligned to the strategy so that we, we don't have unfunded mandates. There's a lot more there, but hopefully that helps answer, start answering some of your questions. Could we come back on capacity building, Marshall and Nate? I, I mean, I would just add on the proverbial marginal dollar question. Um, for, from where I sit and from where DOJ is, I think, um, it's about investing in our people. Um, it's about retaining and recruiting the best people we can have. Um, that that, to my mind, is where if we could spend one more dollar, we'd, we'd retain that one extra fantastic prosecutor or agent or, or bring that person in, or analyst. Um, and if, because if we don't have those people who have the skills to Kemba's point, the training that we need to invest in, and just the, um, the, the mission-oriented capability, I think uh, uh, we're not gonna be able to get where we need to go. Just quickly on capacity building, and uh, I'll just say that a lot of the good work that's happening in this area, in, in, in my space, was started and nurtured by Chris Painter. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for that, Chris. And three things that, uh, that um, we're doing to try to close the gap that you identified, global demand for capacity building, limited number of things that we can do. Uh, first, uh, we're making a push for a dedicated cyber assistance fund. Um, we did it after 9-11 for counterterrorism. We should do it now. Uh, we don't have the mechanisms in place for rapid, dedicated response. Uh, that would help a lot, and I think there's support for it on the Hill. Uh, second, uh, we need to get beyond flying people around the world to deliver hands-on capacity building. That's necessary, but it's insufficient. Uh, the gentleman from Strategic Education, I'm sure, knows about how to, yeah, how to deliver scaled uh, capacity building using online tools um, that we do to complement uh, in-person delivery. So we need to modernize our delivery mechanisms for basic cyber capacity building globally. And then third, and this is a lesson I think we saw in Ukraine, we've seen it in Albania in the wake of the, uh, the uh, Iranian cyber attack, there's a large role for the, for the private sector here uh, where we can play a, a brokering and introduction uh, kind of role, but they're not government dollars being used, uh, and we can bring a lot of private sector capacity to bear quickly. Appreciate that. All right, we're coming into our five minute lightning round, so we'll keep our answers short. Mm -hmm. If you can keep your questions short, sir, I'll start with you. My name is Jay, Jay Park from Radio Free Asia, and thank you for the talk today. And I would like to ask uh, more about malicious actor, especially uh, the actor sponsored by the adversary, uh, North Korea, Russia, China, and Iran. So how U.S. government are uh, responding or uh, preparing for uh, there are cyber threat and how each agency is cooperating. Okay, all right, so we have our big three question, then you, ma'am. Hi, I'm Stephanie Schneider. I work in strategic cyber threat intelligence on the corporate side. Um, I was wondering what some of the challenges are that you see in government responding to quickly evolving and emerging threats, threat actor TTPs, um, and have we become more resilient, in your opinion? Um, and how does the U.S. strategy um, address some of those um, challenges? All right, actor specific and then our resilience. Who wants to start? I'm happy to take um, the first question on um, malicious actors. Um, it's something that I think DOJ, FBI, our intelligence community partners, our law enforcement partners, our interagency partners are, are relentlessly focused on. It's, um, uh, what I think we spend uh, much of our uh, day and night um, working on and worrying about. Um, and I think here, uh, as is consistent with the strategy, um, the, we need 
to, it, it's really an all of government, all instruments of national power um, uh, approach. Um, we, ha as I mentioned earlier, have shifted our thinking from trying to figure out who did the last attack uh, and bring them into a courtroom to how are we going to use our tools to prevent the next attack um, and to, and to uh, find the, the malicious actors um, and uh, disrupt them uh, and dismantle their infrastructures. That's the way we're seeing it. We're trying to use every lawful tool we have uh, in innovative ways to, 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 uh, to achieve that objective. Um, so that's, I think, how we're thinking about um, the malicious actors and, and, and how to pivot towards them. Just on the, um, there was some uh, groundbreaking legislation last year uh, called CIRCIA, the uh, Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act. Uh, Congress had been trying to pass this for a decade. We finally got it. And it says essentially that critical infrastructure needs to report into CISA any significant events. Uh, this is incredibly important so that we can work very closely as we do with our FBI partners. Uh, to ensure that, and this is not about naming or blaming or hurting anybody's reputation or stabbing the wounded. This is entirely about helping the victim, rendering support, and very importantly, being able to warn the community so that they can get ahead of uh, a potential intrusion. So another thing that came out of CIRCIA was the Joint Ransomware Task Force, and we co-lead that with the FBI, and we've already started to implement two really cool things. One is the ransomware vulnerability warning pilot that's designed to decrease the prevalence of ransomware attacks across the ecosystem. And then our pre-ransomware notification work where we get tips from researchers and industry and are able to warn victims before that malware uh, is activated. And so that has been fantastic in terms of detecting disruption, working with our partners on that area. To the malicious actor, I think one thing that we haven't really talked about, um, somewhat surprisingly in an hour and a half of cybersecurity, uh, is China. And I think about Russia as uh, the hurricane, and I think about China as climate change. This is, as we know, the preeminent threat that we're going to be able, that we're, we have to be able to deal with. Um, and that's why we've been so focused on this idea of sustainable cybersecurity, safe technology, uh, corporate cyber responsibility, persistent collaboration. Because if you just read the assessment that came out from the Intel community about China, you'll see very clearly uh, China's intent to hold our critical infrastructure at risk in the event of some sort of a conflict like China blocking the Taiwan Straits to reunify Taiwan. So we absolutely need to be laser focused on being prepared for that from a resilience and security perspective. I'll just. Oh, I'll just add a couple of things. So you can't, Jen and, and Marshall raised fantastic points. The, the point of Circe is that you can't, you can't really manage what you don't measure. And right now we're in a situation where we're not really measuring the incidence of ransomware, for example. I think when DOJ or FBI took down Hive, they had the decryptor key and Brian Voindren mentioned to me one day, I think it was, you know, he saw that only about 20% of the victims, uh, I don't know if that's right, 20% right. of the victims actually reported um, so we saw really how little people are reporting. So it's hard to manage what we can't measure. That's the point of Circea. Um, on, on the threat actor piece, the point of the cybersecurity strategy is to not allow our threat actors to set our agenda. It is to really have that affirmative vision of what we want cyberspace to look like. So no matter who the threat actor is, whether it's a transnational organized crime, whether it's a nation state, whether it's somebody with, that builds faulty equip, you know, software or something like that, that we remain resilient, that we're prepared. The best way to defeat ransomware is to not let them get in the systems in the first place. It's a pretty sticky problem to, to get out. That's significant. Nate, any closing thoughts for us? Not on that. Okay, all right. We appreciate everybody's time. Stay in your seats if you would. So we're gonna have a, a special conversation here coming up. Um, Craig Newmark, who's founder of Craigslist and Craig Newmark Philanthropies, who has been leading into the cybersecurity philanthropy space and is the creator of the Cyber Civil Defense Initiative is going to sit down with uh, Graham Brookie, our Vice President for the Digital Forensic Research Lab here at the Atlanta Council, talk a little bit about what civil society and the philanthropic community should be thinking about in response to and hopefully building on this strategy. But I hope before we go, you all quickly join me in thanking our panel, Marshall, Jen, Nate, Kemba. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Part out and left.
Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Graham Brookie. I'm the Vice President of Technology Programs here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and for those of you on our online audience, thank you so much for remaining tuned in. Uh, for those of you, just a note to our online audience that uh, the in-person audience is getting appropriately hydrated and or caffeinated for, uh, for this conversation, but we're going to kick it off right now. Um, my role at the Atlantic Council is, is that we've walked the walk that all of the professionals that you just uh, saw up on stage are. We've consolidated all of the programs that uh, do defense tech and cybersecurity and information technology security uh, into one program. And so my role is to, to somewhat coordinate or be responsive to all of our folks here. I'm so, so excited to be joined uh, by a man who needs no introduction, uh, Craig of Craig's List and any number of other philanthropic endeavors. Uh, we're going to skip all of the kind of fluff. You all were here for the last conversation, uh, so skip the recap and drive straight into one really core component of what we heard in the National Cyber Strategy, which was a public-private partnership, which, Craig, you've led any number of efforts in, in supporting and in activating and in, in pushing along to do a little bit more. And the latest is, is cyber civil defense. And so how do, you, how do you see that effort? How do you, what are they doing? What happens next with them? Well, of course, like everyone else, I'm obsessed with CISA. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but aside from that, I've been reflecting a lot including in this conversation, what's the origin of all this? Why am I doing it? Uh, my parents lived through World War II. Back then, everyone was expected to play a role if they could. Everyone was expected to be a patriot. And there was all this greatest generation thing. Nowadays, uh, sometimes uh, those terms are used by people who mean it or who are just uh, being uh, bullshit operators. I've decided that uh, I should rise to the re that responsibility as an individual. I guess I should be a uh, for real patriot. And that means doing what I can to bring a lot of people together in civil society, nonprofits, civilians, to play their role in all this. Mm -hmm. You know, that means organizing what I'm calling cyber civil defense, uh, getting uh, teams together through the people that I work with, a lot of whom are still in this room, mm -hmm. and to work together to do a lot of the things from the grassroots up, to do a lot of the things that uh, governments sometimes can't do, mm -hmm. to actually uh, protect us all as a country. Because we are a country at war, much like in World War II. We all need to play a role, just like people did in World War II. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm pushing. It's my job to follow through. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. So far, committed to 100 million uh, in those efforts, connecting people that need to be connected. I haven't done anything like that, connecting one group to a CISA, which I obsess with. Uh, that hasn't happened for 20 minutes now. Right. And so just pulling all these people together, that's already happening with the, the help of people here. My uh, intention is that no matter what's going on on the civilian level, I want to be able to tell you I know a guy. <laughs> and you certainly do know a guy. And I can say, I, I can confirm on record that, Craig, you're probably one of the quickest responders to emails in connecting uh, across the space that, that I've, I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, one thing that stuck out in, in the conversation about the national cyber strategy was this emphasis the two major shifts on one shifting from individual risk and responsibility to systemic responsibility for overall cyber risk. So how do we create more resilience systemically across the space? Uh, and this shift in long-term investment, which you've walked the walk on both of those things. Uh, I guess my, my specific question there is where can things like cyber civil defense organizations play a role in designing and helping implementing, uh, not only implementing things, but creating the ideas and implementing things like labels for technology devices or testing programs, things like that? Well, people can get educated in these matters and start uh, demanding that products be uh, secure by design. Mm -hmm. The deal is that in this uh, ongoing war, we have to realize that a lot of our, uh, the products we use at home 
are internet connected and possible attack vectors. I'm not that worried about my uh, coffee maker, but uh, any car that I buy in the future is going to be an internet, internet connected device, and I want the manufacturer of that car to exercise some due diligence to do their best to uh, design it so that it's secure. Mm -hmm. You know, you can only ask what's reasonable, but they should make a good faith attempt to do that. Then they should make a good faith attempt to test it. And then consumer organizations like Consumer Reports could actually do some additional testing and slap on that car or coffee maker. Let's call it a cyber nutrition label, which will say, hey, this device was tested in good faith, in a reasonable way, and uh, passed. The idea is that that's one path which uh, I'm already funding through Consumer Reports. There's, uh, oh, there's other ones going on. For example, you know, corporate, so corporate social responsibility has to catch up with cyber civil defense. The idea is that people in these corporate social responsibility groups need to start telling shareholders that they're at risk in terms of liability if companies don't make at least a good faith attempt at securing their stuff. And so that pressure has already started to happen through social responsibility groups, but maybe more importantly, through the insurance community mm -hmm. because liability. Right. I, one of the, when I worked at the White House, the cyber team was rapidly growing. And whenever they wrote uh, talking points or public remarks for uh, an engagement that we were going to go do or something like that, uh, the White House speechwriters would always get us into trouble whenever we use the term <laughs> cyber hygiene. Uh, they said it's not a term that people are going to are going to latch on to. It has connotations. Uh, let's talk about resilience. Uh, but we're really, really talking about res labels create more resilience or cyber hygiene in this space. Uh, but the the other part of that major shift in in the national cyber strategy that they just published is this element of long-term investment, the United States government creating long-term generational investments in expertise in this space, uh, reviewing the authorities and partnerships in this space. Uh, and you, on a personal level, have made a number of long-term investments in this space in, in creating more resilience. And so how do you view the next, uh, I, Let's, t let's take the frame of the question that Trey asked everybody uh, of your potential successor of, of support in this space. How do, you, how do you view the investment that leads to what happens next? <laughs> well, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> the theme is that what I'm doing is trying to help and protect the people who help and protect our country. Mm -hmm. And that includes a lot of uh, organizations in, uh, in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. There's a long list I'm uh, trying to help out. Uh, that includes the Girl Scouts. That includes Girl Security. It includes groups like Vets in Tech. Mm -hmm. Their deal is that they train vets and military spouses for jobs and careers in cybersecurity. Uh, side advertisement, we owe a lot to vets and we know that. People have never really realized how much we owe to military families, mm -hmm. so it's time to walk that walk. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what I'm trying to do in terms of uh, my succession, right now, again, putting my money where my mouth is, starting to increase my investment in nonprofit and civilian level cybersecurity uh, to 100 million. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, have, well, I do worry that I am uh, at my age. I'm living on borrowed time, so I need to plan for what will happen so that I can go well beyond this hundred million to help protect the country. Uh, one plan is just to finish uploading to uh, Hologram Craig, mm -hmm. <laughs> but otherwise I'm trying to put my uh, affairs in order so that the effort just keeps going on and just keeps going on. I mean, I used to say that uh, with customer service, you know, I'll do it only as long as I live, then it's over. But now uh, Hologram Craig will, uh, will take care of that for me. <laughs> well, and who knows, with, uh, with uh, generative artificial intelligence, uh, the Hologram Craig might have some very specific language patterns that directly match uh, what you're saying right now. 
Well, I'm comforted in that I started studying that kind of AI sporadically, literally 50 years ago this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well ahead of the curve, uh, as per usual. I, I guess I, the, the follow-up question to that is, where would you like to see other investment in this space? If, if you were advising uh, other philanthropists or foundations institutionally, giving that work with civil society, as you say, uh, work with uh, the people that are supporting the, the defenders in particular, to steal a term, as Director Easterly said, to defend America, uh, where would you like to see others invest their time and resource? Well, there are some really good groups which don't fall into any category neatly. Mm -hmm. There's one group that I work with and heavily fund. What they do is they uh, scan the entire network looking for crime scenes that may even have been uh, undetected. Mm -hmm. They go ahead and look for these. They collect evidence. They work with law enforcement. Uh, both in the U.S. and through the entire world. And they've been really, really successful in terms of uh, treating uh, bad actors, mm -hmm. both cyber criminals and actual uh, spies. They've treated them to uh, handcuffs and uh, vacations where they can be away from all that. Mm -hmm. This group, which I uh, want to call for the moment CSI Internet, mm -hmm. is really, really successful. They've worked extensively with federal law enforcement, with federal prosecutors to stop a lot of things and to send a lot of people away. And in doing so, they've shut down a lot of the servers that uh, bad actors would use to do things like collect ransomware payments. Mm -hmm. Because these guys are not only good at shutting down crime scenes, but they're good at redirecting uh, what infected systems send to the uh, bad actor servers. They're also really good at tracing the flow of ransomware payments. Mm -hmm. The deal is that, uh, again, even uh, planning for the future, I won't be able to fund this group indefinitely, so I will be going around uh, asking uh, different people in philanthropy and in government to uh, pony up. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, the... That's the first time I've ever said pony up in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to ask, the, the, as somebody from Colorado, I, it's a term that I'm familiar with. Um, the, I have to ask one more question about your philanthropy, which is, uh, I, for, those of you, for those of us that have tracked your work and, and your giving and your, your activists or your activism in this space, uh, we also know that you're passionate about bird watching. Uh, and so is, is your philanthropic endeavors with pigeon rescue in particular, are, are, is that related to cybersecurity at all? Is there an angle there that we're not aware about? Well, the deal is that I love birds. I uh, have a sense of humor. And for the rest of it, I'd be happy to tell you, but I'd have to kill you. That's, that's tough but fair. Um, I, then I will not ask a follow-up on that, and I will pivot to something t completely different. Um, on uh, one of the elements that we heard a lot about from the various entities, and especially Ambassador Fick, uh, who has the remit to do uh, foreign policy, but it, but it has an interesting job in that the State Department used to have a lot of different offices that theoretically did tech policy, different parts of tech policy. And what they did uh, over the last year, two years, is put the cyber team in the same bureau as the digital economy team working on trade issues or ITU issues, uh, and the digital freedom team uh, working on things like the Freedom Online Coalition and internet security globally. Um, I, but we heard a lot from the previous panel on this kind of nexus between both foreign and domestic policy and how cybersecurity runs through it. Uh, and you've, you've worked at that intersection for a long time and supported efforts like the Cyber Defense Assistance Collaborative Network, or CDAC, because uh, it's Washington and we need acronyms, uh, to respond to the technical impacts of the war in Ukraine in particular. And so how, do, how can civil society and government and industry especially, industry has been very active in, in response and support uh, for Ukraine in particular, but how can they better collaborate on the protection of infrastructure during things like armed conflicts? A lot of it has to do 
with getting people to talk with each other and to then work with each other. In my case, to put some of my own skin in the game, mm -hmm. which usually means writing big checks. The deal is to remind people and to remind them again to figure out just how much annoying is the right level of annoying for me. Now, I can be uh, kind of annoying uh, because, after all, you know, like I know a guy. Yeah. And so I just uh, persist and keep persisting doing that and trying to enlist people in different areas to be uh, a champion mm -hmm. of those areas. Um, they may or may not be in the uh, expected place in civil society or government. Um, I don't care too much about that, although I'll do my best to uh, stay in my lane. But I will encourage people and cur keep encouraging people. I used to think, again, uh, well, I'm committed only as I, li as I live. Death will release me. But once we finish the upload into you know, Hologram Craig and solve that uh, problem in quantum entanglement, then I'll be around annoying people forever. That's, that's a number of steps uh, to singularity. Um, that, that was the quintessence of nerd humor. Of course, that's, we, we've reached the peak, which, I, to be clear, we, we had a good long lead up to peak nerd humor during the last panel as well. They, they teed us up pretty well. Hey, I'm, I'm funny for Washington. <laughs> Craig, the bar is surprisingly high to be funny for Washington. No, it's very low. Um, <laughs> the, the, that makes I guess the follow-up question there is, how, what lessons in, in persistence uh, do you apply from your days on, on the customer service beat with Craigslist? Um, well, the biggest lesson I had to learn, speaking as a nerd and someone who just doesn't read social cues, is to uh, not be a jerk. And... Also, I've learned to simulate social skills for as much as 90 minutes at a time. I can fake it for that long. <laughs> so we're coming right up on it. Yeah. That sounded like a joke, but uh, may not have been a joke. That's, that's tough but fair. Um, OK, pivot to, to one of the topics that was talked about a lot on a more technical basis, uh, security by design. And you've pretty consistently said stuff should be secure by design, comma, Someday. <laughs> what does that look like? Does the national cyber strategy, from what we've heard from the experts on the last panel, are we moving in that direction in a good faith way? How, how can we move the dial on that a bit more? We're moving very uh, slowly in that direction. Part of the uh, solution is to always be thinking about uh, how can someone break the code that you just wrote? Mm -hmm. It means write, writing in memory-safe uh, languages like Rust. There's an awful lot of internet infrastructure uh, written in older languages like C or C++, mm -hmm. which in some respects are very uh, fragile. I learned just how fragile C is. In uh, 1985, teaching myself C in a walk-in closet in the IBM Detroit building. And I learned it the, uh, the hard way. The deal is that you just have to keep thinking about it all the time. You do not want to move fast and break things. You want to move fast and deliberately at the same time, which is uh, hard. But when I had a very minor role in building home banking for Bank of America, mm -hmm. that was the attitude. And uh, my biggest individual job there was to write a stress tester which was going to break home banking. And I did succeed in breaking it twice. Mm -hmm. Ironically, that was the first commercial use of a memory safe language, Java, that I'm aware of. And this was in 95, which reminds you that I'm very old and living on borrowed time. <laughs> Understood. Um, you're saying that it's moving slowly. Uh, your, your initial comments are that we don't have much time in this space. We're in a conflict footing in this space. And competition or conflict uh, in cyberspace is growing. And so uh, what, what would you like to see done to move it a little bit faster? I think we begin by reminding everyone that we're at war, like World War II. Everyone is expected to play a role and then make the education and tools available to everyone. Everyone needs to be able to protect their stuff, 
whether it's at home, on the road, at their business, and help people realize that it's all, not all that mysterious, that most everyone who's computer literate can protect their stuff and their family stuff, and if they're good at it mm -hmm. and are inclined, they can move into a career doing that because there's well over 400,000 open positions in this uh, country alone. So the idea is to uh, remind people that uh, we're a country of patriots, forget what the, uh, the bullshitters say, mm -hmm. and just to follow through with that, in my case, again, I gotta practice what I preach, mm -hmm. uh, up to and possibly beyond my demise, and to just keep doing that, and then just keep uh, doing that, and not stop. There was a question, uh, so the emphasis on, on building a broader field of expertise, more diversified expertise, and just enough expertise to put butts in seats in all of these jobs, uh, in all these jobs that we need critically. Um, we're running out of time, so I'll end with, with this question, and I'm gonna steal it from Trey Herr, uh, who posed it to the last panel as well. Uh, this room is engaged in industry, engaged in capacity building, or the audience includes a lot of folks that are really, really trying to get those jobs. Or, or uh, as one questioner uh, it said, very obsessed with CISA, which I hope you go work at CISA. Um, I'm obsessed with CISA. <laughs> right. What, what advice, given your breadth of expertise, your career, would you give to someone who is thinking about public service in this space? Thinking about I, I, not just public service, maybe in government, but also in industry or civil society. What advice would you give on, on how to go about okay. that? Um, keep looking at what CIS is saying. Keep looking at what we're saying through the cyber civil defense. Help is on the way. It's a lot slower than I thought because we need to build the education that everyone with uh, basic literacy can use. We may need to do some uh, tool development because regular people need the same kind of tools that can check out their stuff like big enterprises I have. Um, I have a feeling I'll be uh, subsidizing a lot of that development, both education and tool building. I don't really know because uh, you know I'm in over my head. This is normal for me. Um, any of my success has been by being at the right place at the right time. That makes me the forest Gump of the Internet. <laughs> but more deeply, my deal is like, uh, like the Batman says, maybe I'm not the nerd you want, but I'm the nerd you got. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much, Greg. I mean, okay. One one last question based on based on that. You've been involved in any number of these things across the field, uh, or very specific historical moments. I think that if we took a montage video like Forrest Gump of all the moments that you've been a part of, uh, then it would be a pretty fascinating video. Um, looking forward, what's the thing that you're most excited about in this space? Um. I'm most excited just very personally, uh, speaking as a nerd who's been reading uh, about AI for uh, 60 years, I'm interested in seeing the, co the collision between science and science fiction. Mm -hmm. What happens when these AIs realize that they can evolve themselves? What happens when uh, two AIs fight with each other to force hundreds of ge generations of evolution really fast? and uh, then call themselves uh, Skynet. So I have to, I, there's a follow-up question there. I have to ask this. Uh, any number of business leaders just came out, uh, or uh, practitioners across the field just came out and said, we should, we should probably slow down this AI stuff for a little while and have, have rules-based approaches and, and think through some of the security concerns, including a number of innovators. Uh, we heard from the last panel, uh, especially Director Easterly, that we need a rules-based approach. We need to build in security by design now as opposed to be responsive to it when something goes wrong with, with the sci-fi version of events that could be real-world version of events here very soon. Um, where do you fall in that camp? Slow down um, and figure it out, or we'll figure it out. We, well, I support something called the uh, Responsible AI Initiative, 
which involves Mo uh, Mozilla and a bunch of other folks. The deal is to come up with principles now while not slowing down because there's a lot of bad actors who are only getting faster. For example, if you're going to train a data set, do not include uh, news sources which are going to lie to you. You know, right now the uh, best place to train, maybe the place to start, is Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Like I say, it's where facts go to live. Mm -hmm. Not perfect, but really good, getting really better. I, to to date myself a little bit, I, when when I was in high school, all of the librarians said you can never cite Wikipedia, and at this point, what, it's one of the only functioning marketplaces of ideas that still exist. Uh, and so, with that, we'll we'll wrap for today. Thank you for all of your work in this space. It's been a pleasure hearing uh, not only the views on on national cyber strategy and where we're at. Uh, but on any number of other topics that we're going to be working on for the next generation, two, three, four, uh, along with hologram, Craig, when we when we bring that online. So, a nerd's a nerd's got to do what a nerd's got to do. <laughs> Thanks so much, Craig. Craig Newman.